I'm a marketer by trade, and I've been working in the energy industry for more than a decade. Um, and during that time, I've seen a lot of disruption, everything that's happened with mobile phones and digital, with Uber and Airbnb, and I've seen our, our behaviors change radically. Um, a great example is the organic and sustainable food movement. Um, ten years ago, if you wanted to eat organic, sustainable food, you basically had to be a member of a local farm, you had to wake up early on a Saturday, and you had to drive to some pickup location, and you got a basket of fruits and vegetables, and whatever you got is what you got. Um, today, if you want to eat organic, sustainable food, you can stop at your Whole Foods um, and pick up whatever you want. And if that's too much for you, well, then you can just stop off at Chipotle on the way home and serve a sustainable dinner. So our behaviors have changed dramatically. People care about what they're putting in their body. And, that, and being able to make convenient and affordable choices has really changed the way we think about it. I think there are a lot of parallels between the organic and sustainable food movement and what we need to see in the energy space over the next few years if we want to combat climate change. When you want to change behaviors across a, a broad population, you need a few things. You need engagement, education, and empowerment. Engagement being that you care, that you're interested, that you seek out information, that you talk about it with people. Education in that you kind of understand the nuances behind the topic. You don't have to understand every technical detail, but you kind of get the, the gist of it. And empowerment in that you feel like what you do has an impact on the future, that you can make a difference by being a part of it. And I think today in the energy industry, we don't have these things. Um, and a third of people say that only time that they think about their energy usage. Um, and the, of that third, half of them say they think about it when they get their bill in the mail. And that's the only time they really think about where their energy comes from. Um, yet, and they look at their energy provider as someone who's supposed to keep the lights on, right? That's how they think about the whole thing. Yet, all that's going on while 82% of the world's energy is created by fossil fuels, which is the number one contributor to climate change. And we're just completely disconnected from this, this concept and our part in it. And even those people who are somewhat connected and interested and maybe are reading things about it, and we're seeing, you know, especially thank you to the Pope, we're starting to read and hear more about this. Everything you see is very doom and gloom and negative, right? This is an article I pulled out of Fast Company, but I could have pulled it from anywhere. Five reasons to be pessimistic about climate change. And the article goes on to talk about um, humans are so lazy, they're never going to do anything until it's just too late. Um, so you're surrounded by this idea that there's nothing we can do about it. So you're, you, what you do is you try to block it out. It's not even happening. You put your head in the sand, right? You don't want to engage in something you can't do anything about that's bad. Um, so I think this really contributes to this lack of engagement, lack of knowledge, lack of what you can do about it. We did um, an experiment recently where we set up three panels in an airport. And one of the panels said solar power, one of the panels said wind power, and one of them said fossil fuels. And we put hidden cameras behind there so we could watch how people behaved. And we allowed them to come up and charge their phones while they waited for their flights at the airport. So most people chose solar or wind um, because renewables are good. Um, but the conversation we had with them, why they made that choice, was very superficial. It was very much about, um, you know, well, I know solar's better than fossil fuels, those are bad. Um, and then there were still some people who came up and plugged into fossil fuels. And not only did they do it, there was one guy in particular who was so adamant, I mean, he walked up and he plugged into fossil fuel <laughs> as if he had done something. And so, we were all just like, why well, we got to talk to this guy? So <laughs> when he was done, we, we grabbed him and we said, so hey, why did, why did you make that choice? And he said, well, um, my phone needed to charge and, and I needed it to go faster. And if I plug into fossil fuels, it's going to go faster. <laughs> and we were just like, oh gosh, OK. Um, the sort of that miseducation, that misunderstanding, and that lack of ability to move past the status quo and consider that there might be another way to do things was just really highlighted as we did this experiment. We're hoping we actually are going to take this experiment to Paris, so um, we're excited to see what that group does. Um, Einstein said, the world we have created is a product of our thinking, and it can't be changed without changing our thinking. 
For me, this quote and this idea is so true about climate change. The way we think about energy, the way we think about our lives, the way we think about the changes we can make, it all has to shift if we really want to change that trajectory that we're on. When I was a kid, you know, climate change was not a topic. It, was, it didn't even exist to our knowledge. Um, and, you know, it, as I've gotten older, the conversation, you know, it's there a little bit. People talk about it some. You see it in the media some. Um, but it seems to sort of stem around, is climate change real? Is it, how fast is it really happening? Um, is, are all these natural events that are occurring, these droughts and these floods and tropical storms, is that really climate change? Or maybe that's just El Nino. And I mean, you hear these things all the time. You hear people talking about it, especially in a city like Houston, right, where our economy is driven by oil. It is a taboo topic. I mean, you do not talk about climate change in mixed company. You know, if you're at a table, you know, you have to know who's there before you start talking about climate change. So I think that, you know, this is kind of where as adults we sit in our conversation and in our awareness. Um, but the one thing I want to share with you guys today is something that's made me feel a lot more optimistic about what's possible. Um, and that is the next generation. Our kids today think about things so differently, and they're way past awareness and all the way into acceptance. And that ability to accept that this is a reality in the, of the world that they live in is clearing the way for them to think about possible solutions and to be focused on that and not be caught up in the other part of the conversation. So Douglas Adams said, anything that's in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. <laughs> anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. So when I heard this, I was like, this is exactly what's happening uh, with the conversation with climate change. It's just, it's not something that um, we know how to interpret as adults. It's something that just has been, you know, a recent finding for us. So I want to share with you, I talked to some kids between the ages of 8 and 13. So these are young kids, and I did not have any kind of conversation with them beforehand. We just blindly asked them what they thought. And it's a small group of kids, but I think you'll find it interesting um, what they say climate change is. Oh, whoops. Let me go back. Oh, sorry. There we go. The climate change is when um, one of the gases like get so there's a lot of it and then it starts getting a lot of it and then it causes global warming climate change is like well it's like a lot like the ice age like when they were in the ice age and then it started to warm that was a climate change it's not good for the earth I mean I guess I don't like it yeah Depending on the degrees of how much it changes, I think it can either be very easy to adapt to or very hard to adapt to. We need to try to do something about it. Is that good or bad? It's bad. So you can see that these kids have already sort of accepted that this is part of their world. It's a part of you know, how they live. Um, and you'll see as we move forward that it allows them to sort of focus on the possibilities, right? They're not stuck in this idea of is this happening or what is it. They're just trying to uncover what they can do about it and what their part is. Um, I sometimes call this when I'm talking with my kids and some of my coworkers, kid think. Like this ability to leave the baggage and the conversation that's been going on for so long um, behind you and really focus on the future and what's possible. And I think we need to adopt more of that in the way we think about probably everything, but specifically climate change. Because all that baggage that we're carrying around is keeping us from really starting to make changes in our day-to-day -day lives and do things that will, you know, long-term help help us change the trajectory. I want to share with you what, we, what they said when we asked them, you know, well, what would you do about it? What do you think you can do about climate change? And they start off by talking about things that are available to them today, but probably things that not all of us do because it requires a behavioral shift. So hopefully they'll start guilting their parents into doing it. Um, that's one way. But then at the end, they start really talking about possibilities, things that don't exist today. And it sort of blossoms into what could be possible. And I, and I think that's such a beautiful thing. So take a listen. We could start turning off lights. We could start biking and walking more than using cars. 
We could um, ride bikes more and walk more. We could just stop using fossil fuels. Switch to electric cars. Turn off the light even if you're going to the bathroom. Well, I think we should make batteries smaller. We could use more solar power and wind power and other sources of energy that aren't uh, fossil fuels. They could make a tra little trans transportation uh, solar panels that you maybe could put on your watch or wristband or bracelet. We could make air solar powered airplanes. Because airplanes go in the air and you can eat the slightest bit of air of the sun. Boom! Putting solar panels on cars? Solar powered sewing machines. Ooh, a solar powered self locking stall. Boom. We're already creating new inventions that are run by solar power and wind power, like the solar powered airplane and the solar powered backpack. Uh, there's already these inventions out here, and if we just keep creating these inventions, eventually we can just change the world. So this idea that, you know, they're ready to, to figure this out. They're into this problem and they're ready to move it to the next stage. But I think we have to remember that we can't just wait around for them to do this, right? We have to lay the foundation right now for, for our kids to be the solvers, to continue to, to change this for the positive. And so just real quickly, I want to make you guys aware of what is possible today. Um, you know, conservation, obviously, these are the things you hear about all the time, whether that's a programmable thermostat or is your home energy efficient, turning off the lights, those things. Those are all things that we can adopt into our life very simply. But we also have other things we can do. So most of you who live in Houston have a choice. Um, you can decide who your energy provider is and you can decide what plan you're on. And you can choose a 100% renewable plan for like cents more than what it costs to be on a fossil fuel plan. And making those choices starts making companies think differently about what they need to offer. So you're pushing them into that next stage. Um, solar is a technology which is just exploding. I mean, you hear about solar all the time, and in Texas, we're lucky in some ways in that our um, price for electricity is very low, so solar has not caught on here. But in places in the Northeast and California, everyone is getting solar on their roof, and it's an exploding um, industry right now. So you could consider that, because in the next few years, that's going to become more cost effective for all of us. Um, and for those people who aren't homeowners, we're also working on some things just around the corner, which are in a Vermont right now, where you can permit a solar garden near your neighborhood where we would build solar panels, and then we would take that energy and, and give it to your house or apartment. You wouldn't even need to be a homeowner. You wouldn't have to have a roof that's right, which would really open up solar uh, as an option for lots of people. And then electric vehicles. I mean, this is something that sounds like sort of futuristic maybe to some people, but if you have a two-car family, this technology is something that you could take advantage of. You can do a commute to work on that technology easy today. And if you have a second car that allows for, you know, a road trip or a longer journey, then your family could actually have an EV, and they're becoming less and less expensive. Um, you know, there are lots of options out there, not the Tesla probably, but um, lots of other options out there, the Volt, for example, that are um, actually very cost effective for a family to own. So these are things that you can do today. But what I would tell you is all of these things are great and we should be doing all of them. But the most important thing that you could do is just start thinking about it. Like start being mindful in the choices that you make and start having the conversations with people. Start talking about it to your friends and your family and kids. We've got to make this something that's important to us and that we care about. And as we start to do that, then solutions will start to bubble up and people will start working together in ways that we can't even imagine. Um, we actually did the energy experiment with these kids that we talked about, um, and they had a little bit of a different response to um, what their choices would be. Um, so I'd like to show you kind of where their head is and what they're thinking. I chose wind because, it, first of all, it gets very hot in Houston. And without wind, we wouldn't really survive. I picked the solar power because there's more sun than there is sometimes wind. It's extremely convenient. It's cool to have sunlight powering lights. I don't think it's, a, it's as expensive as windmills. I honestly just have a thing for solar power. I just find it cool and like interesting. I don't know. Yeah. 
I know that fossil fuels, I mean, I may be wrong, but I heard that fossil fuels can sometimes cause chemicals that aren't good for the earth. More people and more people are doing it, and it uses stuff that is always there. But also don't think that like because you're one person, that no matter what you did, you wouldn't really make a difference. Because if everybody thought that, then nobody would make a difference. But if everybody thought, well, I'm one person, but I can still make a difference, a difference would be made. So I love that. The difference would be made. So I leave you guys today you know, thinking about, not as the CMO of an energy company, but as the mother of two young girls, what you can do to be a part of this conversation and what you can do to make this part of our you know, bigger talks that we have with each other and the way that we think about moving the future forward. So thank you very much.